uh, James chapter number 3. James chapter number 3. And what we're learning about is uh, we're, we're doing a study called No Place Like Home. And uh, the Christian home, uh, biblically, should, there should be no place like it on the planet. Uh, listen, guys, I believe church should be a special place. I, I believe that the home should be a special place as well. And uh, I would say that there should be a difference, right, between our homes and the world's homes. There should be a very clear distinction. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, look at what the Bible says has to happen or what should be found in a home that is a Christian home, to make it a, uh, no place like it, right? Uh, look at James chapter 3, and I want to read one verse from James chapter 3, and then we're going to go ahead and dig into the rest of this. James, right there toward the end of your New Testament, right before Peter, James chapter number 3. James 3, look if you would, at verse number 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. And what you have in James chapter 3 is the Lord describing two kinds of wisdom to us. Uh, if you say that you believe that God created the world in six literal days and he rested on the seventh, the world thinks you're an idiot. Do you understand that? They think you're crazy. Now, I, I, would, I would counter that with, Okay, give me what you believe. Well, I believe somewhere back, billions and billions of years ago, an explosion happened, and out of that explosion, an amoeba came out of that, and from the stardust, and the stardust produces this amoeba, and then it grew a tail. Then, guys, I'm sorry, it takes a lot more faith to believe that. That's insanity right there. All right, that's a, the man that taught me the Bible. You said it's a fairy tale for grown-ups. All right, uh, but the point is this: there are two kinds of wisdom in the world. All right, there is a sensual wisdom, which is what you'll find in secular education and philosophy, things like that. And as parents, we do the best we can to prepare our kids for when they, you know, if they ever do go to university, that they're prepared to, to, to meet the onslaught that is going to come their way. All right. So th that all said, there's a different kind of wisdom. Look at verse number, uh, let's see here, back a little bit. Uh, verse 17, ne next verse, excuse me. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without, par without partiality and without hypocrisy. And so what you have again is, and the Bible, the Lord does this all the time. He contrasts good and evil, right? He contrasts truth and error. He contrasts righteousness with unrighteousness. He'll contrast clarity with confusion. And today what you have going on, uh, when it comes to the Christian home, and there's an attack on your home, you understand that. All right, there's an attack on the Christian home, and the attack, one of the angles that the devil uses is confusion, all right? Uh, number one, who's, who's in the leadership role, all right? What's the role of mom? What's the role of dad? What's the role of husband? What's the role of wife? What's the role of the kids, all right? You get those things out of order, and you've got a mess, all right? And uh, what we talked about uh, in the weeks leading up to this uh, was that your home should be a haven. It should be a place of opportunity, a place of ministry, and a place that reminds you of eternity, all right, everything that you do in that home. I mean, I don't care if it's taking out the trash or cutting the lawn or, or, or uh, you know, having a meal together. It should all be done to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, yesterday, my daughter was doing a little uh, horse show. She does this annual thing every year with the Arapahoe County for the 4-H club that she's in. And I told her, I said, look, I don't care how you score. I said, I want to know that you, you're doing it for Jesus Christ. And do it to put a smile on his face. All right, everything in your home should remind you that, listen, the kids aren't mine, they're God's, right? The kids are, are, are the heritage of the Lord. And, and, and my spouse isn't just mine. It's, this is the Lord. That he's given me this woman. And, and, and he's given me this man if you're a lady, all right? So that's what home should be. And we talked about, uh, right after that, five R's, if you're taking notes, five R's of the home. Now, uh, the guys went downstairs to pray this morning. I said, guys, uh, pray that God really works in the church service and all that. And uh, Brother John Haffey says, we're going to pray that somebody can understand your writing. <laughs> Amen. All right. So this is where we ask the Holy Spirit to interpret what's going on up here, right? All right. So we've got, number one, respect. We talked about that. And uh, uh, there's a respect. There's an honor that the husband should give to the wife. And there is a submission that the wife should render to the husband. Uh, these, are not, these are not easy things to accomplish, by the way. But they're biblical. Uh, all right, there's a respect that the children should have for the parents. There's a respect that the family should have for the biblical authority. All right, secondly, there is a reliance on the Holy Spirit. If you don't remember anything about last week, remember this much. 
All right, a carnal Christian will make small things big. A spiritual Christian will make big things small. You, you, you can take things that, man, they, they're just, they're really in light of eternity. They're not all that significant. And you could just magnify them and blow them up and make that the center of your attention. Uh, you know, parents, as, as you have kids, and they're all different, you know, sometimes you have a kid that just tends to uh, automatically focus on the one thing that isn't right. Help them understand, hey, that's not how you look at life. You know, I mean, it's like that in a family. It's easy to nitpick on each other, is it not? Uh, guys, it's that way. In a church, it'll be easy the longer we get to know each other. When someone first comes, they go, man, I love the preaching. It's such a blessing. Give me six months. You say, why? Because eventually I'm going to annoy you with something I say, right? In the multitude of words, there one is not sin. All right? So uh, reliance on the Holy Spirit. And that, that, that goes back to walking in the flesh versus walking in the Spirit. Uh, let me give you some doctrinal things again, just by way of review for anyone that might be taking notes, or maybe there's a little bit of lack of clarity on this. All right? Uh, look in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. I want to give you, again, just by way of review, some things that I think doctrinally are very, very important to understand about this. All right? When you uh, were saved, when you were born again, and those are synonymous terms in the New Testament, uh, something happened uh, inside of you. And you, listen, if somebody had asked me, what is spiritual circumcision? The day I got saved, I would have been like, what? If somebody had asked me, uh, Adrian, did you just get baptized in the Holy Spirit? I would have been like, What's, what does that mean? I didn't understand every, listen, that baby was just born. And, and you know, <laughs> it's so funny this morning. We're all like, ooh, ah. And you could just see the parents like, please don't wake up the baby. Please don't wake up the baby. Please don't. <laughs> right? Right? You know? Uh, when that baby, that baby, you know what that baby thinks about? I'm hungry. I'm dirty. That's about all that's ever going through that kid's mind. Pick me up, I'm hungry, I'm dirty. Pick me up, I'm hungry, I'm dirty. Why? Because it doesn't understand that mom just faced the jaws of death to pop that baby out. Amen? All right? That baby doesn't understand all the stuff that went into that. That baby just knows I'm hungry, I'm tired, hold me, I'm dirty. Right? And listen, spiritually, when you get saved, you don't understand everything that happens to you from a technical standpoint. That is what discipleship in a local church is about. So you get a hold of everything that God did when you got saved. All right? But let me explain this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, look, if you would, at verse number 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Notice he doesn't say one baptismal water are we all baptized in one body. There's no water in this passage of Scripture. I know I've said this before. Some of you are like, Pastor, you've said it so many times, it's ingrained in my head, and I just say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. All right? Uh, but remember that when you see baptism, don't automatically equate it to water, and when you see water, don't automatically equate it to baptism. So in this passage, what he's talking about is a spiritual baptism that takes place when you get saved. Look at this. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. All right? And so the idea is this. The moment that you got saved, you were, you were baptized in the Spirit of God. And you were filled with the Spirit of God as well. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, if you take this, this uh, cup of water and you've got a tub. This morning, um, uh, I had the sprinkler running. And we don't have enough water pressure to run the sprinkler and the water hose for the animals. So the sprinkler's running, you know, because we're not, <laughs> I don't know if God's judging the state of Colorado or what. We're not getting any rain. Lord, please send some rain. Um, but the sprinkler's going on, and I, I realize the chickens don't have water. So I, I get that tub, and I, I break it open, and I put it into the horse trough, and I bury that thing. You say, what happens? That trough, that, that little uh, chicken water is now baptized in the horse trough. All right? And the water has filled that little chicken water. And here's what's interesting. The chicken water is in the, in the water of the horse trough, and the water is in the chicken water. You, you, you with me? All right? It's, it's totally immersed. So when you got saved, that's exactly what the Lord did, is he put you in the Spirit of God, and you were placed in the body of Christ, and at the same time, all right, as, as that is going on, you are filled with the Spirit of God. Now, here's what happens the first time you sin after salvation. You grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And how you respond to that determines how filled you are with the Spirit of God or how filled you are with the flesh. And so that's what you need to get a hold of. It's not so much the Holy Spirit leaves you. You'll see that in the Old Testament. 
that is different than the New Testament. Aren't you thankful for that? Oh, man, I read that story about Saul, and Saul's a, while he is a good, uh, a good picture of a carnal Christian that just gets led by the flesh, one thing that's different, and that's where the analogy sort of breaks down, is that Saul, when he doesn't do right, and he gets, uh, he gets sideways with the Lord, the Spirit of God leaves Saul, and that's something that will never happen to you. Thank God. Uh, you know what he says? Be content. You, so you say, why? Knowing this, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. All right? Uh, but it's important to understand that as, as a Christian on a daily basis, all right, you have an opportunity to be a little bit more like Saul or like David. One of the greatest pictures in the Bible, in, 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 in side by side, when they're both alive, David's a picture of the new man. He's the king that should be on the throne that God has already anointed. Yet he has not yet received his kingdom. Are you with me? That's Jesus Christ. All right. And then you've got Saul who everybody knows. They have this thing in suspension. He's not the right guy. We got the wrong guy on the throne. All right, but he's the guy that's on the throne. And what you have to learn to do is swap him out, is don't let Saul run the show. Saul is the flesh. And if you let the flesh have an inch, it'll be a ruler. You understand me? The flesh will dictate to you what to think, what to say, how to react to situations. The, the flesh is never satisfied. Um, I believe it's in Proverbs, and if one of you guys can uh, find it, that's great. But it talks about some things that are never full and never satisfied. You know what it says? The eyes of man is one of those things. You say, what is that? That's a great picture of the flesh. I just want more. I, and the flesh will say this, just one more time. Just one more time. Just one more time. And then you know what? It's never just one more time. When you give in that one more time, it makes it easier to do it again and again and again. And when it comes to things and matters of the home, when you, when you react to something because you are in the flesh, well, she just knows how to push my buttons. Well, we hang out long enough. I'll know how to push them. You know how to push mine as well. The question is, why are you pushing them? And then here's the next question. When someone pushes your buttons, do you ever step back and go, you know what, I've done this before and it's not right and I should just have a little bit of grace with them and I'm not going to respond in the flesh. You say, what is that? That's reliance on the Holy Spirit versus reliance on the flesh. And it's very easy to get the two. What, what's very easy to do is, again, I said before, familiarity breeds contempt. And, and so you, you, get to, you get to, oh, you know, the dating. We went through the dating stuff, you know, and they, they look at each other and they go, oh, she could do no wrong. And he's just my prince and he's my knight in shining armor. And then you wake up next to him after you're married like he stinks. He's got morning breath, right? Don't be like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Morning breath is awful, all right? I don't care how wonderful and glorious and spiritual they are. Morning breath, there is no morning breath in heaven. Amen? <laughs> Everybody who smells like Banaka Blast or, you know, some kind of mint or something. Um, but, but the point is this, is you realize they've got flaws and they've got issues, and, right? And it's very easy to focus on those things. You say, what is that? That's a work of the flesh. You know what the Spirit of God does? The Spirit of God says, yeah, they got that problem, but man, look at this, man. She made me coffee. Didn't even have to ask her. What a blessing. You know, I mean, seriously, you get, you get to know each other real well, and that's the purpose of marriage. That's the purpose of a home is to know each other intimately. The, 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 the unfortunate reality is the more you get to know somebody, the more you see their flaws, the more you see their imperfections, the more you see their problems, the more you see their issues and their inconsistencies. Uh, couples, can I help you out with something? When you use the word never and always in an argument, you are wrong. You're automatically, you know, no, 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 but I'm right about this one. You're still wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you say, why? Because the reality is that you hate, you hate when someone turns that thing around on you. I mean, come on, how many times someone said never and always to you, and you're like, uh-uh, remember that one time? <laughs> right? All right, the, the point is this. Go to Galatians 5 real quickly. Again, just by way of review. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. You know, uh, hey, can you do this? Why do I always have to be the one to do it? You know, kids will get bad about that too. I don't want to leave the kids. I'm an equal opportunity preacher. I want everybody to get in on this, all right? Uh, kids, when your parents say, hey, do this for me, how come you didn't ask so-and-so? How come you didn't ask my brother my sister? I don't know because the words that came out of my mouth were, can you do this? Right? All right. Now, what, what I'm saying is this, is that, that it's easy as a kid because you get to know mom and dad, and you might even see that mom and dad tend to always lean on you. Hey, maybe take that as a compliment. Hey, I can trust that you're going to get this done. Right? But it's easy to, to just operate in the flesh. Look at Galatians 5, 
And uh, we're going to come back, by the way, to Galatians 5 uh, in the uh, uh, Sunday morning message. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. And look, if you would, at verse number 17. You need to get a hold of this. Uh, there are people that teach, well, if you're really saved, you won't do these things. X, Y, and Z. And here's what I've learned. Whenever someone says that, they have already decided that they don't do X, Y, and Z. Therefore, they're saved, and you have to meet their standard, right? I have learned that's a really, that's, number one, it's really bad doctrine. All right? It doesn't line up with the Bible. But also, it's really bad practice, and it makes you the measure of all things. Uh, guys, I was thinking about this this morning. I, I, I've come very, very close. Uh, some of you know this. I have a secular job, and there are, are, are times when I have a platform to, to influence others in my company. And uh, I, I will say things sometimes. I know the days you're like, where did this come from? And what it is is we have these Monday morning meetings, and they don't know it, but I don't get to get everything out on Sunday. So some of it spills over, <laughs> you know. And, you know, they, when they talk about man, Voltaire, the great philosopher, said this, man is the measure of all things. What an idiot. You say, I can't believe you talk that way. That guy's a fool. And he steered a lot of people to hell. And, and let me tell you this, if man is the measure of all things, stop dying. If you're the measure of all things, quit dying. You can control that, right? Well, no, we haven't figured that, and you're not going to. You know why? Because it's the result of sin. That thing was set in course thousands of years ago. Uh, my, my point is this. My point is that sometimes when you make yourself the center of something, uh, things get off. Why? Because the Lord should be the center. And look, if you would, at, at verse number 17, what people don't get a hold of sometimes is this, is that when you get saved, all right, um, your flesh... And you're a body, a soul, and a spirit. I know this is review for most of you, but I want to make this clear. You're a body, you're a soul, and you're a spirit, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You are made in the image of God, right? Genesis chapter number 2, Genesis chapter number 1, let's make man in our image, 127. All right, so you're a body, a soul, and a spirit. When you got saved, your soul was saved. Your spirit was brought back to life. Your soul was washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Your spirit was, was renewed, all right? It was a dead spirit according to Ephesians chapter number 2. And it was born again. It was given life. You know what God does there in the Garden of Eden when he makes man? He takes him of the dust of the ground. And the Bible says he <sighs> breathes into his nostrils the what? Breath of life. That's inspiration. What is that? Putting spirit into something. Inspiration. So you know what happens when you got saved? Man, isn't that good? A little, a little, a little binaca blast from glory. Amen? Some fresh breath from a, The Lord just goes... <sighs> And you, get, you have a, lot, a living spirit now. So now you can connect to God. You can speak with the Lord. All right? Whereas before you couldn't. All right? But there's a third part of you I, I mentioned. That's your flesh. And your flesh is not saved. You say, how do you know that? You can read Romans 8. We don't have time to do it this morning. You read Romans chapter number 8 and you find out your flesh is waiting for adoption. Your spirit's already been adopted. Your soul's been adopted into God's family. But that flesh is waiting for the adoption. It's going to happen. It's not like, well, I hope it happens. I, I, I hope God's right. God is always right. And the rapture will take place. And, and don't let anyone steal your hope from you. The Bible talks about that being a blessed hope. Those that are teaching that the rapture happens in the tribulation, they're messing the whole thing up. That's not how that thing goes. The Lord gives you that blessed hope, and, and that's found in Titus chapter number 2. And that thing is, is very important because that's when you receive the fullness of your salvation. You have not experienced that yet, and you will not in this life. You say, why? Your flesh is there. I advocate this. I advocate you have standards, you have borders in your home, you have things that you go, we won't allow this, we won't allow this, this isn't right, we're not going to speak that way. That's important to have in your home. By the way, can I say this? Just because you have standards, that does not make you a Pharisee. All right, a lot of people think these days, well, you're legalistic if you say you can't watch that. No, I just don't want my head filled with trash. Right? Um, all right, but, but here's the point. The point is you can do all those things and you still have you to deal with. Right? Right? You still have you to deal with. And in order for you to get along with someone that's, that God says you're supposed to love, like Christ loved the church, gentlemen, and ladies, the Bible talks about the older ladies that they may teach the younger ones that they may love their husbands. Now, let me ask you a question. Does someone have to be taught something that they naturally do? You know why you got to teach your kids? Let me give you an example. You're like, I don't know. I think I love my husband naturally. Well, let me just, there's a, there's a test of pressure that comes at some point with that. Uh, let me see you like this. Uh, when they were little ones, you know, 
and they're getting bigger, and that stinks, you know, but it's a blessing as well, and it's hard for a dad. It's hard for a dad, you know, to see a guy looking at his daughter, and just, I want to go up to the guy and go, hey, you looking at her? Yeah, that's my daughter. <laughs> isn't she, pr- put your arm around us, isn't she pretty, oh yeah, shut up. <laughs> um, but when they were little, sorry, that was a little diversion there. It's hard being a dad of teenage girls, all right? Cut me some slack. Um, but when they were younger, you know what we taught them? Thank you. Please. You say, why? It ain't natural. You know what's natural? Ah! That's natural, right? And parents, you've got to reapply some education, all right? Listen, when it comes to the government, I don't like re-education camps, but let me tell you something. Children need re-education, amen? And that's supposed to be executed in the home, all right? But the idea is this. You teach them to say please and thank you because naturally the thing is, Mine. All right, look, naturally, you might think, well, I just love him. You love him until you get cross with him. And that's why it says that they may teach them to love their husbands. And so my point in saying all of that is this. You've got a battle going on between your flesh and your spirit. That battle does not, you don't walk out of church. See, this is what I think Christians do. They go, okay, when it comes to uh, missions, our missionaries, that is spiritual. When it comes to tithing and giving, spiritual. When it comes to, you know, reading your Bible and praying, spiritual. When it comes to my relationship with my wife, well, that's just me and her. Oh, man, if you're saved, it all belongs on this side. All right? And so, and so every, you say, why are you standing on a chair? I can't see all of you back there from, uh, I'm short, man. I'm like 5'7", you know? And so you have to take everything from this column and move it over here and go, okay, Lord, this is all of yours. Amen. All of it. All right? And so look at Galatians chapter 5. For those that might think, well, you know, if, if, you're not, if you're not doing these certain things, you must not be saved. Watch out, because you've got a battle that is raging the moment that you get saved. All right, look at verse 17, uh, Galatians 5, 17, or verse 16, rather. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are what? contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would the same guy that writes that writes this over in Romans 7 the things that I would not those things I do and the things that I would those things I do not oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death you say what is he saying guys that is one of the most spiritual people you'll ever know in your life in church history he writes half of the New Testament he got 27 books he writes 13 of them all right and so here's this guy that writes all this in three missionary trips and leads a lot of people to the Lord and disciples a lot of people and we are fruit of his ministry to this day all right so thank God for the Apostle Paul you know what he says I would say can we all agree on this is he a spiritual guy can we say he's a spiritual guy all right you know what he said my flesh sometimes dictates to me what I do you know what that means just because you're saved doesn't mean you don't have a battle with your flesh and just because the battle is there doesn't mean you're not saved. All right? I, I get tired. I get put out with preachers talking people out of their salvation because they, they, they've made a mess of things. Look, you can make a mess of things as a saved person. The way to avoid that, however, is here. Look at verse number uh, 18. But if you let, be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, and he's pointing out to you what the natural byproducts are going to be of living and walking in the flesh. You live in this body, but you are called to walk in the Spirit. All right? Look at verse number 19. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication. Uh, and can I get this out of the way, too? Just because something is natural doesn't mean it's right. Adultery and fornication might be considered natural in some cases, but it ain't right. Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Look at the list of stuff here, man. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife. Do you realize strife is listed in the same list as witchcraft and hatred? Seditions, heresies, envyings, holy smokes. By the way, holy smokes is a biblical term, Exodus chapter 19. All right? (laughs) Envyings, murders, envy and murder in the same list. Drunkenness revelings and such like of the which I tell you before as I've also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not not it doesn't say that they won't be saved it says they won't inherit your inheritance according to first Timothy it has to do with the fact that whatever you do in this life as a believer from the moment you get saved 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it lists in detail this thing called the judgment seat of Christ. And depending on how you live this life as a Christian, how obedient you are to the Lord to do what He's asked you to do, all right, the work that He's asked you to do, you will be rewarded for that when you get there. Yesterday, Bella, I, I, this is just fresh in my mind, so forgive me a lot of horse show illustrations, but after every show, they go, okay, you know, if you ranked in the top whatever, three or whatever, you get this ribbon. And I just thought, you know what? Not everybody, they had a class of 12, not everybody placed. Some got no place. They were part of the horse show and they're part of the club, but they didn't get the ribbon. Are you with me? You can be saved and not be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It means you miss out on your inheritance. But notice that if you operate in the flesh, that is the end of it. You miss out on things God has for you. Look at verse 22. But, I like that. But, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I guarantee you, if you talk to the average lost person, they would still say that I would like to have those things in my home. Here's the problem. You can't have them in your home consistently without having God's Word be preeminent. You can't have them in your home if you're operating in the flesh. If you're thinking according to the natural person inside of you, if you're thinking according to the flesh, and you've got your mind running according to things of this world, and there's not a spiritual thought that goes through your mind all day, and you get home, and then there, all of a sudden your wife says something, your husband says something, ah! You say, why is that? It is the result of operating in the flesh all day long. That's why the Bible says to pray without ceasing. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? You mean i got to go to work and kneel in my office and pray at hours? No, you'll get fired for doing that. And it won't be religious persecution. It'll be because you're not doing your job, all right? But it means that whenever you're at work and your boss is telling you, I want you to do this, you go, yep, you got it. And you're thinking to yourself, I don't know how I'm going to get this done in time. Lord, would you give me the grace to do it? God, would you give me the wisdom to do it? And, and someone says something that, you know, maybe wasn't so much appropriate. And you go, okay, Lord, how do I respond to that? Lord, would you give me wisdom in how to say that? Lord, I don't want to turn away. I don't want them to think, you know, that I don't care about their soul, but I, I just i am not comfortable with that. Lord, would you get, you say, what is that? That's praying without ceasing. That's operating in the spirit versus operating in the flesh. Guys, that doesn't stop when you leave church. It needs to happen that much more. This is sort of somewhat for the most part, for, and I say for the most part, it's somewhat of a safe zone. The devil still tries to get in, but this is for the most part safe. Out there is the battle. And sometimes it's in our homes. You say, how do you, how do you win? You rely on the spirit of God. And we're not going to turn to it again, but last week we looked at how Saul sat on his throne. And you say, how did he sit there? I don't know. I envision he probably looked like some of us look sometimes. I mean, you're the king, right? You've got everything, don't you? Yeah, but it's not enough. Some people don't respect me like I deserve to be respected. As a matter of fact, they said, you know, Saul is slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. You know, and does this thing actually work? Couldn't I? There we go. You know, and, and, and they, they paid more attention to David than they paid to me. And, and by the way, he's sitting right there. And you've got everything you need. And instead of being happy and content, you've got a javelin in your hand just waiting for someone to cross you. You say, what is that? Ah, that's a great picture of someone operating in the flesh. You say, who's that? Saul, 1 Samuel 18, 1 Samuel 20, 1 Samuel 19. All right? So again, for, for there to be the kind of home that we want to have, there has to be a, 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 a respect for one another, for the God, for biblical authority. There has to be a reliance on the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, let me say this. Roles have to be marked in the home. All right? It does not matter where you're at. One of the biggest issues, and I heard this uh, said over and over when I was in Bible school, the ultimate universal issue is who or what is the final authority in any situation. It's like that at church. It's like that in the home. It's like that at the workplace. It's like that in the government. Who or what is the final authority, right? And as Christians, you know what we naturally say? I think we, we for the most part, would say, uh, the Bible, and, and if you really know yourself, the King James Bible is my absolute, it's the absolute authority for all matters of faith and practice until it crosses me. <laughs> right? You say, well, what is it? Well, we, we say, okay, this is the authority. Listen, when it comes to the home, you have to define who's in what lane. Uh, this morning's message is entitled, Stay in Your Lane. You know what the problem is? We get cross. We get in someone else's lane, they get in ours. Sometimes we invite people in our lane don't need to be there. Sometimes we invite ourselves into a lane that we don't need to be in. <laughs> the point is, it's, it's something that's so important, it touches every aspect of your life, but especially when it comes to the home. Let me say this first off, roles need to be defined. 
Roles need to be defined. You know what we started off with, guys? James 3.16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to blur the lines. Mom is dad, dad is mom, kids are parents, parents are kids. It's just sort of whatever. And if you watch the average sitcom on TV anymore, listen, I'm not saying I grew up in a sanctified home, but you got to give me this. All right, the full house of the 1990s is a far cry from the stuff that's being played on TV today. Right? I'm not saying it was a spiritual show or even that it was good, but you got to give me that, guys. It is not the same. The last 20 years, so much has changed in our society, and it has infiltrated the church. You say, what is the problem? Roles are being confused. The roles have to be defined. Uh, look at, let's take a, t- a trip through Timothy. I want to point something out to you that maybe you've never noticed. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. I don't want to be unthankful, so I, I'm going to drink the coffee she made me. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, we're not going to read the whole chapter. But you know what's going on there? He is defining the role of a pastor and of a deacon. Say so why? Those are the two offices that you're going to find in a church. Two positions that, that God ordained. All right, that's why when Brother James was uh, selected to be our deacon, the guys, we prayed on him. You say, what was that? That was an ordination for him to be our deacon. All right? And so, and the same thing with the pastor. I was ordained at New Beginnings Baptist Church in White House, Tennessee, before I came here. I didn't just get the idea I'm going to be a pastor. I, there was something behind that, all right? And the whole point is this, is that God defines these things in chapter number 3. You know what happens in chapter 4? Look at chapter 4. Just sort of skim over it. God defines the role of the church in the latter days. So in chapter 3, he defines the positions of leadership in the church. In chapter 4, he gives warnings to the church and defines the role that the church should be in in the latter days. Look at chapter 5. You say, what does he do? He defines the roles of elders and widows and young women, and young men. Look at chapter number 6. What does he do? He defines the roles of servants and masters. Now, here's a question for you. Why would Paul spend uh, pretty much the latter half of the book of Timothy outlining roles as his first and most important? Guys, listen. If you're writing a letter to somebody, it's the first letter you write to them, and this guy's a young preacher, why would he spend half of the book talking about roles if it wasn't important? He understood this guy, if this guy has any chance of surviving in the ministry, he's got to figure out what the proper roles are, number one, so he can be the right example of the church, and number two, so that he can set in order the things that need to be set in order in the church and teach them, even those families that are there, hey, this is how you should be, this is how you should be, this is how you should be. Now, everybody, let's work together. All right? Without those roles being defined, you know what you have? You have confusion and every evil work. Can I say this? I think we could all agree on this, guys. Where our society is at today with the family and the home, there's chaos, there's confusion, and conflict that is unnecessary. Those are three things that are found in most times. You say, why? Because the roles haven't been defined. Now, we have defined some of these things already. I'm not going to go through all of them again, but men, you should be leading. Amen, Amen, preacher. I don't know why that's such a hard thing for some people to get a hold of. Guys, listen, that's part of your job. You know what's not easy? That. You know what I'd rather do? said I, whatever will be, will be. You know that, honestly, if anybody knows me by nature, that is my personality. The ministry has changed me. <laughs> but really, I've learned you can't live life that way. Things have to be defined. Listen, in the home, guys, you need to be leading that thing. Now, when I say leading, that doesn't mean, you know, honey, I don't think those are the right color of shades. I think you need to change those. Guys, if you're that focused on that kind of stuff, something's wrong with you. (laughs) Amen, amen, amen. All right? Uh, But what I'm getting at is this. I'm talking about leading in the things that define what your home is going to be, the decisions that are made on a daily basis. I mentioned this before. I'm not going to belabor the point. But people say all the time marriage is 50-50. I would disagree with them. At a certain point, it has to be 51-49. Who's making that call? And ladies, what we talked about was be careful not to manipulate your husband into thinking that he's doing what God's telling him to do when you're just telling him what to do. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. All right, I'm going to duck right now. There you go. All right. 
Uh, ladies, let me say this. Follow graciously and compliment him. That's why you were created, to compliment him, to help him. All right? Children, obey. Simple concept, hard to do. <laughs> obey and serve in your home. Now listen, this was a Harvard study of several hundred preschoolers. These researchers discovered an interesting phenomenon. Only 60%, they, what they did is they went to a, a playground and they recorded the sounds of girls and boys. All right? Today, you, you know, so maybe, you know, they're talking about the fact that you don't really know what you are. Listen, you're born one way out of two. Amen. I, I recently read something where it says there's like potentially uh, 200 and some odd genders. I'm like, the people, society has lost its ever loving mind. Because they've rejected final authority truth. When they reject that book, you, you, you basically sign your death letter as a, as a society. If you don't believe that, study the kingdoms of Rome and Greece. You'll see the same stuff that's going on in America in 2018 was going on back then. You say, what is the problem? Roles are not just not being defined. It's a switching of the roles and saying there is no such thing as any kind of role anywhere. All right? They did this study where they, they went to a playground, they listened to boys, and they listened to girls, and they, they recorded this stuff, and here's what they found out. Only 60% of the sounds coming from little boys were recognizable. You see what I mean? Like, they were words. You say, what were the rest of the 40%? Ah! You know, and I'm sorry, I, you, you may disagree with me. This is, this is just pastor being me, myself as a person, all right? I like to see boys playing army. All right? I just do. I prefer that. You know what? I, I think boys should play with dolls. I do. Hang them, man. Hang them. You know? <laughs> you will tell us the secrets or we will, you know, I mean, that's how boys ought to be. You know? Uh, that, that, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, even me saying that, some people are like, I don't know. I think they should play with dolls. Why? Yeah, that's right. that's right. Naturally, they don't. You have to force it on them, man. Why would you force something against nature unless you've got an agenda? What's going on out there? You understand that? All right, so 40% was vroom and ah and doot doot, you know, and, and ha ha, you know, and that kind of thing. Have you ever watched boys play? I mean, that's it, man. That's it. I don't have any boys, but I was one, all right? So I know, I know a little something about when parents go, you don't know what it's like to have a boy. I'm like, I was one. <laughs> Does that count for anything? You know, I remember my brother. I mean, I mean, it's so true. All the time is, is da, 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 and boom, and bam, and all right, whenever I hit like this, you go, you know, and I mean, that's what boys do. That is a stark contrast from the little girls. Communication experts say that the average woman speaks over 25,000 words a day. That sounds like a lot to me. <laughs> While the average man speaks only a little over 10,000. Now, how does that affect marriage? That's a good question. Because ladies, don't expect him to be you. You don't want him to be you. Sometimes you get what you wish for and you regret it. <laughs> and gentlemen, you don't want her to be you either. You know? What's up, brood? What's up? You know? Guys, you know what guys, when they're playing a football game, they do a good job. Slap them on the butt. There you go. All right, let's go. You don't want to treat, you know, your wife like a bro. All right? You want her to be a lady. She's going to want to talk more. He's going to want to talk less. You, you got to learn to do. You got to understand who each other, you got to understand the other person. And you can't expect them to be something that they're not. At the same time, you need to serve each other. Guys, you don't hide behind, I'm a dude, I don't talk. All right? You, you can talk. How was your day? Good. All right? Well, well, you know, she wants to know, okay, who did you see, and what did you do, and, and, you know, at lunchtime, what did you eat? I mean, guys don't think that way. I have never asked my wife, what did you eat today? I just don't think that way. But she what did you have for lunch every time? Uh, I don't know, a shake? Well, there was food in the fridge. I know, I just, you know, and then we get on a 30-minute conversation about the food that's going to go bad if we don't take it out, you know, and, and uh, the, the point is this, we're different. The roles are different as well, by the way. The roles are different as well. So one snowy, stormy Christmas Eve, a perfect couple was driving along a winding road. Have you ever met someone you think is a perfect couple? Perfectly whitened teeth. You know, they're both just in perfect shape, and, you know, the kids are perfect, and everything's perfect. Can I say it's probably not what it, you think it is? One snowy, stormy Christmas Eve, this perfect couple was driving along a winding road when they 
notice someone at the roadside in distress. Being the perfect couple, they stop to help. So what do they find? Santa Claus. Huge bundle of toys. And, you know, they didn't want to disappoint any of the kids on Christmas Eve, so they thought, you know what, we're going to load, this perfect couple is going to load all of Santa and his toys into their ginormous gas-guzzling SUV. <laughs> Soon they were driving Santa around to deliver those toys. Unfortunately, the driving conditions, Christmas Eve, deteriorated, and the perfect couple in Santa Claus had an accident. Only one of them survived, coming to a theater near you. Who was the survivor? The answer is the perfect woman. She's the only one that really existed in the first place. <laughs> Everyone knows there is no Santa Claus. There's no such thing as a perfect man. You know what the man's response is? If there's no perfect man and no Santa Claus, the perfect woman must have been driving. <laughs> and this explains why there was a car accident. <laughs> now, I just, just you know, offend everybody at one time. You know? <laughs> confusion, the point, the point, guys, is this. Confusion will lead to destruction. There is a difference between our roles. Men, you need to lead. Ladies, you ought to compliment him in that. Now, guys, it doesn't mean she can't have ideas. Okay. Me, man, you, woman, I lead you. you. Hey, listen, she can have ideas, but at a certain point, ladies, you've got to learn, okay, we've come to the point of no return. We're making a decision, and he's going to make it. I'm going to follow him. That's not easy. I recognize that. It'd be a whole lot. But here's the point. You go, well, you don't know. I don't have a perfect man. I get it. I get it. I'm not the perfect husband. But here's the deal. You know why I know it doesn't matter? I, it doesn't matter if you have the perfect guy or not. You know why? Because we are the church, and we're married to a perfect man, and we still don't always follow him. Am I right about that? But these are the roles that God has placed. Let me say this, confusion leads to destruction. I don't want to read the verse, but if you're taking notes, uh, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 23, uh, that is the first time the word confusion shows up in your Bible. And it's about sexual impurity. And I'll leave it at that. You parents can read that later, your kids, right? But the point is this. The point is that that thing is connected in the Bible for a particular reason. The first time confusion shows up, it's connected with things being crossed that don't need to be crossed. That should tell you something. Confusion leads to destruction. Look at Exodus chapter number 32. Exodus chapter 32. You remember the story where Moses is on top of the mountain? I, uh, I talked to the kids at summer camp, and I told them, I said, look, we're on top of a mountain. We're about to come down. And when you come off the mountain, you're going to find some things that you don't like, some things that are going to be a challenge to you keeping the commitments that you made to the Lord. There's going to be some things that get in the way, and you're going to come on that mountain and go, oh, man, everything's wonderful. You're going to find out things are still where they were, where you left them before you left, and you've got to decide to be committed to the Lord regardless of those things that you find when you come down off the mountain. Moses is on top of this mountain. He's getting the Ten Commandments from God, and God's speaking to him face to face, and what an amazing thing that is. And uh, over there, what ends up happening eventually is he's got to come down. He's got to bring those commandments to the people. Look at Exodus chapter number 32. And uh, look, if you would, at verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God. That's what I believe about this book, guys. Amen graven upon the tables and when Joshua heard the no by the way if I didn't believe that you know what I'd be doing right now I would not be here I'd be fishing I'd be camping I'd be doing something else all right uh, but verse 17 when Joshua heard the noise of the people look at this as they shouted he's hearing hey! he's here he's going that sounds like war you know he's hearing You say, what is that? He's hearing demonic stuff. And you say, what is that? Well, look down at verse number 18. He thinks it's the noise of war. And Moses, being a little bit older, he's the old preacher. Joshua's the young man. He's just coming up. And Joshua's going, oh, no, we got to go fight a battle. And Moses is going, slow down there, pistol, you know. Slow down there, happy. He says, uh, that's not what's going on. What's going on is they're having a party. But here, here's the point in that passage of Scripture. It was confusing. 
No one could tell really what was going on. There are exceptional cases of those who have extreme discernment, been around a while, and they can look at it and go, here's what's going on. Most people can't, they couldn't tell by listening what exactly is that. They would have thought what Joshua thought, which is that there's a war going on. By the way, if you listen to music that sounds like a war, you're probably listening to the wrong kind of music. All right? And I don't want to go too far off because we've got to wrap this thing up, but I'm going to say it again. I used this illustration last week. Maybe it made you a little awkward. I can say, hey, how you doing? What if I say? I'm not going to look at any lady. Every lady's like, please don't look at me. All right? I'll just imagine there's a lady right here. How you doing? Right. Same words, different way of saying it, right? By the way, when it comes to music, it's no different. You say, oh, the words are so good. But if it sounds like, ah, oh, ah, oh, then you're probably listening to nightclub stuff that doesn't belong in the church. Yeah, that's right. right? By the way, they didn't always sing like that. Where, did that. where did that get introduced? It was introduced by the world. The church adopted it, and now it's okay. No, it's not. <laughs> it's sensual. My, my whole point, guys, is simply this. Things should be clear. Confusion never leads to prosperity. Confusion leads to destruction. If the roles are not defined, you've got confusion. Clarity, let me give you this, is healthy, it's safe, it's right, and it's enlightening. People need what is healthy, what is safe, what is right, and what is enlightening. You say, what, what is confusion? Confusion is the byproduct of rejecting truth. When a society rejects truth, confusion is the byproduct of that. And you know what Daniel says? Daniel gets down to pray before God in Daniel chapter 9. He's going, oh, Lord, we confess our sins as a nation. We, we did this wrong. We did that wrong. And it is confusion of faith that belongs to us. Why does he say that? They rejected God's word. When we reject the roles that God has placed in the Bible of a man and of a woman, of a husband, of a wife, of a, of a dad, of a mom, of the children, when those things are rejected and you turn the thing upside down, you've got a problem. And if you want your place to be no, like no other place, you want your home to be like no other place, then let me give you this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we'll end. Confusion is the work of Satan. Harry Truman said this, if you can't convince them, confuse them. You know what the devil does in your life? He can't convince you. Nope, this is right, but he'll confuse you all day long. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we'll close with this thought. Most of you know this passage of Scripture. The, doc, the context doctrinally has to do with speaking in tongues, all right, uh, which was a sign gift that you learn about over in Acts chapter number 2 and uh, there in the early church. But uh, look, if you would, at 1 Corinthians 14, and look at verse number four, uh, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of what? Isn't that what you want in your home? Then you know what you got to do? You got to define the roles. Roles. All right, again, you know what we got? We've got respect, we've got reliance on the Holy Spirit, and we've got roles. All right, we'll go ahead and stop there. Let's all stand. We'll be dismissing a word of prayer. We'll take a break.